Hey y'all, go to the fire here, got the whole family with me. Hey, hey y'all. But in today's video, we're going to be talking about everything the scriptures say about the new moons, including the book of 1st Enoch, 2nd Enoch, and Jubilees. Okay. In this video, we're going to provide a comprehensive examination of the concept of the new moons as presented in both canonical and non-canonical scriptures. We're going to focus on the canonical Old Testament and the apocryphal texts of 1st Enoch, 2nd Enoch, and Jubilees. By exploring these texts, this study aims to uncover the holy, cylindrical, and symbolic roles of new moons in ancient Israelite and holy traditions, highlighting their significance in ritual practices, social life, and theological thought. We'll look at how the new moon serves as a critical marker in the ancient calendar and social practices. We'll explore how the new moon is depicted in scriptural texts such as the Old Testament, and in apocryphal writings of 1st Enoch, 2nd Enoch, and Jubilees. We'll also analyze these sources, gaining an insight into the roles of the new moon from their practical application in timekeeping and rituals to their deeper meanings within the holy and cosmic structure of ancient Judaism. In other words, we're going to look at everything. Right. We're going down through looking at all the scriptures related to the new moon. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing that's not included in here is something that you may find in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Right. Alright, so let's jump into chapter one. First up, let's look at what it says about the new moons in the Pentateuch. Chris, you want to tell us a little bit about that? In Genesis 1 and 14, it talks about the creation of the sun and moon and describes them as markers for signs, seasons, and days. This establishes the foundational role of celestial bodies in regulating time and holy observances. In the King James Version of Genesis 1 and 14, it says, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be signs and for seasons and for days and years. So here we're told in the first chapter of the Bible that the new moon plays a part in our timekeeping um, along with the stars and the sun. Okay. In Exodus 12 and 2 it says that the new moon marks the beginning of the month and the start of the Hebrew calendar establishing its importance in scheduling festivals and rituals. And the scripture denotes that this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. So this is him talking to Moses telling him in the springtime, right around Passover, that this is the beginning of the month and the moon plays a part in it. That's a very key verse in understanding how the moon works in our timekeeping. Okay. In Leviticus 23 and 24, it talks about how the new moon is associated with the celebration of significant feasts, including the Feast of Trumpets, which underscores its role in the Holy Calendar. And the scripture says, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall you have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, and holy convocation. This is how we know where we're at in the year. They go out and observe the moon right after the autumn equinox to indicate that fall season has started. And they go and they blow the trumpets to let everybody know that the that the second half of the year has started and the fall feasts are about to begin. Moving on to other books in the Bible, we have 1 Samuel 20 and 5, 18 and 24. It talks about how the New Moon Festival provides the backdrop for key events in David's life, including his flight from King Saul. The timing of the feast is crucial to understanding the narrative tension and political dynamics. And also understanding the timing. Because for David and Jonathan to have this conversation, you had to be on a new moon night. Right. It had to be right after they had spotted the moon and blown the trumpets to indicate that the new moon day had started. Right. Stacey, you want to go ahead and read those scriptures? And David said unto Jonathan, Behold, tomorrow is the new moon, and I shall not fail to sit with the king at meat. But let me go, that I may hide myself in the field until the third day at eve. 
Then Jonathan said to David, Tomorrow is a new moon, and thou shalt be missed, because thy seat will be empty. Now see, right here, for him to be so sure of it, he has to have just spotted it. Right. Right. So David hid himself in the field, and when the new moon was come, the king sat him down to eat meat. Yeah, so new moon day. So you have the sighting of the new moon on a night like last night, and then it's the daytime hours that they would have sat down to meet. And right. this is when he's missing uh, David. Let's look over and see his seat's empty. Mm -hmm. Then in Second Kings 4 and 23, it says that the mention of the new moon festivals in context of Elisha's ministry reflects their ongoing significance and prophetic activities in communal life. And scripture says, he said, Wherefore would thou go to him today? Is it neither new moon nor Sabbath? And she said, It shall be well. So she, she's been questioning, Why are you going to see the priest? Right. It ain't the Sabbath day, you know, and it's not a new moon day. So he's showing the, the significance of the Sabbath day compared to, or the new moon day compared to the Sabbath day. And this is because um, in the book of Ezekiel, it tells us that the gates are open on these days so that they would have been able to go in and see, talk to the priest. Right, right, right. We're going to see that when we get down into the Psalms and the Prophets. Starting in Psalm 81 and 3, it talks about how new moons are celebrated as times of worship and rejoicing, emphasizing their role in communal holy life. The verse says... Blow up the trumpet in the new moon in the appointed time on our solemn feast day. Yeah. So, again, like Chris says, uh, emphasizing the role of communal holy life. Like right. New moon in this life because everybody is getting together. Right. The purpose of blowing the trumpet is so that everybody knows what's going on. Mm -hmm. Then in Isaiah 66 and 23, it talks about how the new moon is envisioned as a time of worship in the future messianic kingdom highlighting its eschatological significance and the scripture says and it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me says the lord so like i said futuristic when we start to return back to the ways of our abba father we will again start to honor his calendar and his system of keeping time so that we can make sure our Sabbath days line up with his. Mm -hmm. Then in Ezekiel 46 and 1, it says that the prophet Ezekiel describes the new moon as part of the idealized future worship practices in the new temple, indicating its enduring role in holy observance. This is the one you were talking about, say. Right, this is one where um, it talks about the gates being open. It says, Thus says the Lord God, The gate of the inner court that looketh toward the east shall be shut the six working days, but on the Sabbath it shall be open, and in the day of the new moon it shall be open. Right, and so I don't know how futuristic this is because this is always going on. The gates to the inner court are open during the new moon time. As with the Sabbath day. Right. I think this is one of the um, scriptures that um, taught me, um, taught us that uh, how important the new moon was, uh, was, you know, it's just as important, I guess, as the Sabbath day. Very, very much so. Mm -hmm. All of the rules of them aren't the same. Um, so they aren't exactly the same, mm -hmm. but the new moon is a Sabbath day. Right. All right. Now let's start to look at the extra canonical books or so the hidden books, Jubilees and Enoch. We're going to look at first Enoch and second Enoch. See what it says about the new moon. What does it say about the new moon, Chris? Starting with the calendrical system, Jubilees 6 and 23 through 38 details that the new moon regulates the passage of time and the scheduling of festivals. And on the new moon of the first month, and on the new moon of the fourth month, and on the new moon of the seventh month, 
and on the new moon of the tenth month are the days of remembrance, and the days of the seasons, and the four divisions of the year. These are written and ordained as a testimony forever. Yeah, so you have the new moon of the first month. That's the beginning of spring. That's the time when they start cleansing the temple to get it ready for Passover and getting all of the priests and everybody um, ready for Passover so they don't have an episode like they had back there with Hezekiah and had to do it in the second month. The new moon of the fourth month is the beginning of summer right and you um you can make a historical connection between that and what they call juneteenth which falls around that time you have the uh, uh solstice there around june the 20th and then the new moon after that will be this other the second day of remembrance in the fourth month of course the one in the seventh month is talking about the day of atonement so it's a very important day. I think everybody knows how important it is. If not, they can look for future videos that we'll do as we're getting ready for the Day of Atonement. But the last one, the 10th month, Day of Remembrance, falls during the middle of the week of Hanukkah, or the Feast of Dedication. So all of these are extremely important days already on the sacred calendar, even though we may not recognize them. Right. But these days also have a greater significance when you compare them to what Noah went through. And Noah ordained them for himself as feasts for the generations forever, so that they have become thereby a memorial unto him. Uh, so it's like what we would call Memorial Day on the sacred calendar. These four days of remembrance. Remembrance, memorial kind of goes together, right? Right. And on the new moon of the first month, he was bent to make for himself an ark. And on that day, the earth became dry, and he opened the ark and saw the earth. So this first month is when Noah and those guys are about to go into the ark. Right around the first month, the second month. Um, I'm not trying to be too absolutely sure in this video. But you had the beginning of that ordeal in the first month and then look what happened in the second day of remembrance which would have been the fourth month and on the new moon of the fourth month the mouths of the deep of the abyss beneath were closed so you had the uh, rain to start to come down mm -hmm. and then you have the uh, mouth of the abyss to uh, be closed now this is going to be where the water was going you know so it's not able to actually go anywhere so that's one of the reasons why the earth filled up I guess okay and on the new moon of the seventh month all the mouths of the abyss of the earth were open and the waters began to descend into them yeah so here you see now that they're open the water is starting to dissuade but again this is related to our walk too we can overlap our journey through you know certain spiritual events you know dealing with ourselves and our father that we sim we experience similar things during a similar time periods right if you can get the spiritual understanding of Noah's flood you can overlap them onto these days of remembrance and even gain some insight as to what's going on in your personal life and on the new moon of the 10th month the tops of the mountains were seen and Noah was glad so this is around the time like we said of Hanukkah right and so as probably why it's a joyous occasion. Um, Hanukkah is about joy, the Feast of Dedication is about joy, and that's, like we said, falls in the middle, or the 10th, the first day of the 10th month falls in the middle of that festival. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's go on. Chris, what we got next? Then in Jubilees 50 and 8 through 13, the new moons are discussed in relation to the Jubilee years, emphasizing their importance in the broader calendrical system and their role in marking significant periods. What does this say, Stan? And the man that does any work on it shall die. Whoever desecrates that day, whoever lies with his wife, or whoever says he will do something on it, that he will set on a journey thereon in regards to any buying or selling, and whoever draws water thereon which he had not prepared for himself on the sixth day and whoever takes up any burden to carry it out of his tent or out of his house shall die okay so 
Now, here he's providing scriptural basis that the new moon is a Sabbath day, that it, all of the rules are the same. The rules of the new moon are the same as the rules of the Sabbath day. Right. But if you want to find out about more of those rules, you can check out our many, many Sabbath day classes where we discuss all of these rules in detail. Right. Coming from the book of Jubilees. But for the second time, let's go on, Chris. Going on to the ritual and symbolism, Jubilees 2 and 8 presents the new moons as part of divine order, marking sacred times and reflecting God's covenant with humanity. These four great works God created on the third day, and on the fourth day he created the sun and moon and the stars, and set them in the firmament of the heaven, to give light upon all the earth, and to rule over the day and the night, and divide the light from the darkness. Again, reference in Genesis chapter 1, mm -hmm. and how our moon is part of our clock, our right. calendar. Yeah. And this is important when we think about the covenant because of the feast days. Mm -hmm. If it were not for the moon, we wouldn't get the feast days correct. We would be doing it you know, on any, any day that was right. convenient, probably. Yeah, and once again, you have done uh, many classes on this, so. Y'all subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. We got a lot of feast days coming up. We want to be prepared. And Yabba Faba Yabba Raka on us. This, may he bless us when it comes to these feast days and getting prepared for them. That's what mm -hmm. I'm trying to say. Go ahead. Then in Jubilee 6 and 28, the observance of the new moons is tied to the conventional themes and ritual practices, showing their integral role in maintaining the holy and social order. Want to read that statement? And it says, And on this account he ordained them for himself as feasts for memorial forever, and thus are they ordained. Yeah, so these are our memorial celebrations, memorial day celebrations. Right. And it shows kind of what we're supposed to be doing on these days. You know, if you think about the... Um, traditional Memorial Day celebration and how it goes with barbecues and family and events and you know all of that the only difference is we do it on the first new moon after the solstice or after the equinox and so we get to do it four times a year once doing Hanukkah once doing a memorial blowing the trumpets once right there at the beginning of spring and one right there at the beginning of summer now we move on to the astronomical and apocalyptic context, starting in 1st Enoch. In 1st Enoch 72 through 83, it offers a detailed account of the lunar calendar and the astronomical phenomena associated with the new moons. It provides insights into the understanding of timekeeping and celestial events in the Enochian tradition. We see that specifically dealing with the moon over in chapter 73. You want to read a little of that? Say? And after this law, I saw another law dealing with the smaller luminary, which is named the moon. And her circumference is like the circumference of the heaven. And her chariot in which she rides is driven by the wind. And light is given to her in measure. And her rising and setting change every month. And her days are like the days of the sun. And when her light is uniform, it amounts to the seventh part of the light of the sun. And thus she rises. And her first phase in the east comes forth on the thirtieth morning. And on that day she becomes visible and constitutes for you the first phase of the moon on the thirtieth day, together with the sun and the portal where the sun rises. So it's describing how the new moon works as far as the timekeeping. You get that over in the book of Enoch, like I said, chapter 72 through about chapter 82 or 83. Describes the sun in detail, the moon in detail, and the stars in detail, and then all how they all work together as far as our seasons and even gets a little deep in those chapters. But you see here what he's saying is that at the end of the cycle, the end of these 30th day the moon will be um, it will set with the sun 
and then on the morning of the you see what it says here is that on the 29th day it will set with the sun on the 30th morning it will start to show its light and then that evening it will appear and once it appears the month actually starts that's how we uh, determine each of the months is when the moon appears then in 1st Enoch 82, verse 6 through 12, the new moon is interpreted symbolically with Enoch's apocalyptic visions, reflecting its role in the cosmic order and divine governments. This is when he starts talking to Methuselah. You want to read part of verse 7, mm -hmm. And the account thereof is accurate, and the recorded reckoning thereof exact. For the luminaries and months and festivals and years and days has Uriel shown and revealed to me, to whom the Lord of the whole creation of the world has subjected the host of heaven. So, like I said, this is the book where you get that information. Enoch was shown by Uriel himself, just mm -hmm. like it says over in the book of Genesis. It mm -hmm. says that he walked with the Elohim. Right. Then moving on to the theological and cosmic significance, First Enoch 93, 8 through 11 depicts the new moon as a sign of cosmic order and divine rule, emphasizing its importance in the broader theological framework of Enoch's writing. I want to read that, And after that, in the sixth week, all who live in it shall be blinded, and the hearts of all of them shall godlessly forsake wisdom. And in it a man shall ascend, and at its close the house of dominion shall be burnt with fire, and the whole race of the chosen root shall be dispersed. So this one is concerning the chosen of righteousness and the elect of the world. And concerning the plant of unrighteousness. And so he's speaking those things. So well, I guess this is a warning against those who don't participate in the Sabbath day. Right. Observe the, the number. Very interesting. We might have to do a whole class on that. Let's go. Let's keep going, Chris. Then in First Enoch 104, verses 1 through 4, the relationship between the new moons and moral teachings highlight their role in shaping ethical and moral teachings. Like I told you, we're going to find out everything it says about the new moon. What does it say there? Verse 1 says, I swear unto you that in heaven the angels remember you for good before the glory of the Great One. And your names are written before the glory of the Great One. Be hopeful, for a fourth time you were put to shame through ill and affliction, but now you shall shine as the lights of heaven. You shall shine and you shall be seen, and the portals of heaven shall be opened to you. And in your cry, cry for judgment, and it shall appear to you, for all your tribulations shall be visited on the rulers and all who helped those who plundered you. Be hopeful and cast not away your hopes, for you shall have great joy as the angels of heaven. Uh, okay, so again, talking to those who will obey our Father's will and do what He wants. As well as observe mm -hmm, these festivals that He has commanded for us to observe. Yeah. And, you know, we're talking about the new moon, and if you don't have uh, the moon's representation, then your feast days will be off like we like he talked about over it in Jubilees chapter 6. That's the purpose of the days of remembrance to keep our calendar in order. Then talking about the new moon in 2nd Enoch calendar and ritual observances 2nd Enoch 1 1 through 5 references the new moon in context of Enoch's heavenly journeys, indicating its role in the divine calendar and its impact on spiritual practices. You want to read that? See? There was a wise man, a great artificer, and the Lord conceived love for him and received him that he should behold the uttermost, dwell the uttermost dwellings and be an eyewitness of the wise and great, 
an inconceivable and immutable realm of God Almighty, of the very wonderful and glorious and bright and many-eyed station of the Lord's servant, and of the inaccessible throne of the Lord, and of the degrees and manifestations of the incorporeal host, and of the infallible magistration of the multitude of the elements, and of the various appar apparitions, apparition and inexpressible singing of the host of cherubims, and of the boundless light. So this is how he got all of this information. This is what they mean when they say he walked with the Elohim. And you see here in verse 4 that he's referencing the month. So he already has been educated on, you know, how the moon works by the time he got to write this book. Then in 2 Enoch 32, verses 1 through 6, the heavenly calendar and the role of new moons in it are described, reflecting their significance in esoteric and mystical traditions of Enoch. Now, this is actually referring to um, how the systems work that are outside of our Father Celestials and his timepieces. He has set aside an alternative plan. So to speak. That's kind of what he means by this esoteric stuff because it's really speaking on a higher level when you think about the alternative plans. Satanel and all of those guys. But anyway, let's go on. Moving on to the symbolic interpretation, 2 Enoch 36 talks about Enoch's vision revealing the new moon's role in understanding divine mysteries and future events. Then in 2 Enoch 67, the eschatological implications of the new moons highlight their place in the broader cosmic narrative and their impact on theological thought. So if this one's talking about idols, then is talking about pagan god worship which we learn over in the book of jubilees chapter six that if you forsake the sacred calendar that's pretty much your only real alternative all right we're going to read verse 32 out of chapter six of jubilees thing and command thou the children of israel that they observe the years according to this reckoning 364 days and these will constitute a complete year and they will not disturb his time from his days and from his feasts, for everything will fall out in them according to their testimony and they will not leave out any day nor disturb any feast right, but what happens if you don't verse 33 but if they do neglect and do not observe them according to his commandment then they will be disturbed all their seasons and the years will be dislodged from this order and they will be disturbed the season and the years will be dislodged and they will neglect their ordinances and all the children of Israel will forget and will not find the path of the years and will forget the new moons and seasons and Sabbaths and they will go wrong as to all the order of the years and jump down to verse 38 for this reason I command and testify to thee that thou mayest testify to them. For after thy death thy children will disturb them, so that they will not make the year 364 days only. And for this reason they will go wrong as to the new moons and seasons and Sabbaths and festivals. And they will eat all kinds of blood with all kinds of flesh. So in summary, the Scripture indicates that the new moons are integral in marking significant festivals and times of worship. They talk about how it governs our calendrical systems, mm -hmm. which dictates our holy observances and our feast days. Right. Also playing a part in divine intervention when you think about you know, the stars and the other entities at play. But one thing we know for sure is that it plays a part in our feast days. Keeping the calendar 
I'm getting off track. Yeah. Um, sacrificial offerings. There are sacrificial offerings that are required on the feast days, but we talked about those and how there are supposed to be like Memorial Day celebrations, uh, even with wine and such. Mm -hmm. It says that, um, well, um, this includes what's typically done is um, burnt offerings, grain offerings, and drink offerings. Yeah, um, but we understand that the burnt offerings, um, there was an issue with those. And right. as we study through these texts, we find over in the book of Maccabees how they treated the new moon days as like Passover where they didn't burn the animal up, but they actually got to eat it. Okay. But anyway, we wanted to come in and give you guys, but anyway, we wanted to come in and go through these scriptures and try to find out some more information about the new moons, just being new moon day, and getting ready for the memorial, blowing the trumpets. We want to make sure that we are aligned with what we are supposed to be doing. And so we'll be looking at some more of this as we get ready for the memorial blowing trumpets because we definitely want to get that one right. So if you got anything out of this video, go ahead and hit the like button. If you didn't, hit the dislike button. But leave us a comment either way. And shalom. 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 shalom.